Fortroy Galer and Sotronona the Harkland and Manistrach as in Shade Khan the Hri Symposium of Lyontula A Uchtaran Alin Tori a Khorde Sho Shans doing a Fatsila Dolling Lek Lek Kurs of Few doing Kursi Styre Kursi Queen Khain a Gastrami a Khorfe Vroid or Go Heronic President Artists Ambassador Chairman of the Abbey Board, Dr. Brian McMahon, Chairman of the Arts Council, fellow Senators, ladies and gentlemen, I'm delighted to welcome you to our inaugural three-year annual symposium. What an exciting week we are experiencing at the Abbey Theatre as we begin to celebrate our 110th birthday. We closed the theatre on Monday night to bring our sell-out show, The Risen People, to Wheatfield Prison, an extraordinary emotional night. Next Monday, we bring the same production to our neighbours around the corner on Champion Avenue, the school hall of the Larkin Community College. In between, we're spending the guts of the three days discussing how we should engage with the events, the vision, the trauma, the imagination and the memory of our past. My fear always is that the state will lay its deadened hand on how we might all interrogate the decade of centenaries. But artists at the Abbey Theatre, or indeed Irish Theatre, are wise to that challenge. You will hear them speak of this during the coming days. In a moment of despair, or maybe just confusion, I doorstepped our President in one of his many visits to the National Theatre and asked him what I should do about centenaries. And quick as a flash, he suggested, or indeed perhaps instructed, me to read the speech that he gave uh, to the Irish American Historical Society in May 2012, and there's a small excerpt of that in, uh, in, in your programme. That speech is the reason why we are here today, the provenance of the Theatre of Memory Symposium. It encouraged me to invite public intellectuals, artists, writers, actors, theatre directors, playwrights, critics, and academics to gather at the Abbey Theatre to interrogate that crossroad between history and art, to do it in public and for the public. Thank you, President, for your support and instruction in this. So over the next three days, we will hear keynote lectures, public discussion on theatre and memory. We will hear rehearsed readings of plays, including uh, No Escape by the late Mary Raftery and attend a site-specific work by Samuel Beckett around the corner. Throughout and interspersed during the days are interventions from interlopers about contemporary political and social issues, a reminder of the current state of play, so to speak, in the areas of statistics and population trends, direct provision, the Irish army, and the marketplace. I would like to thank Roy Lennox, Jennifer Doyle and all our donor friends in Boston and New York who have enthusiastically supported our symposium and also to the Arts Council for supporting the Abbey Theatre. I want to acknowledge too the blessings of our patron Professor Deccan Kybert and all my brilliant staff here at the Abbey Theatre. So our first public intellectual to speak at this year's symposium on the Theatre of Memory is our President Michael D Higgins. Please welcome him. Fiak Agase, Yama Ushla, Seguini Court, Tofirkin Ohasam, they live Tronona, Agas Tus, Akar Lishun, Smuin of Shah, Fui Kursi Quivna coin. It's a very great honour to have been asked to open this symposium, which invites all participants to critically reflect on how we in Ireland might engage with memory and commemoration, including that of defining the defining historical events which started our country a hundred years ago. And what better place than a theatre to do so? The Abbey Theatre is a very appropriate place to start our reflection, ties, tied as it is with the cultural movement and the men and women who responded to Ireland's 
economic and political conditions at the turn of the 20th century. So, is minla ma wika sa gwala fiak ma kanila sa akta kude aka sa fakal jasa nyura vime akari lyoher yuv kubla noma darhen. Aka liv iliog tama buyaka sa akta n firkin fosha e dara shivrum smechiakt. As an introduction to this theatre of memory, which will run until Saturday, I would like to consider briefly the relationship between myth-making and ethic, ethical remembering. That is my humble contribution to what I know will be a very, very powerful event. Rather than speculating in the abstract, I prefer to make a reflection on a particular momentous event, the outbreak of which has been commemorated throughout the world this year, World War I. I also want to add my cautious uh, voice as well uh, to those who suggest that the act of commemoration can never be reduced to an event uh, is, is something more important like that and in taking this example of the First World War I realize how that war was of immense significance for so many nations one century later no definitive source of meaning can be ascribed to this event, the causes of the so-called Great War, its political, economic, social and cultural legacy as well, present an, an inextinguishable source of interrogation and investigation not only for historians and social scientists worldwide, but also for theologians, writers, poets, and for so many individuals who are simply concerned with the history of their family. How is it appropriately, ethically reconstructed, recalled, referred to? In the Irish context, World War I as a subject for commemoration poses the difficult issue of Ireland's divided and even divisive memories. It casts the Battle of the Somme, so central to Irish Unionist identity, versus the 1916 Rising as our Republic's founding myth. And for many years, the First World War has stood as a blank space in memory for many Irish people, an unspoken gap in the official narratives of this state. Thousands of Irish war dead were erased from official history, denied recognition because they did not fit into the nationalist myth and its canonical lines of memory. And as I read these lines in my speech, I think as well, of those women removed from both mythic constructs. I think, for example, of the importance and significance of the omission of Eva Goldbooth, for example, and I pay tribute to the wonderful work of Sonia Tiernan in her work on Eva Goldbooth. And it is a good question for you to have in the footnotes as you go through the three days, to ask what is the reason for the general exclusion of women and the particular exclusion of some. And had it anything to do with the work she did together with Esther Roper? I think, uh, as well, uh, contemporary Irish historiography has, of course, in a welcome sense, largely departed from any narrow nationalist historical tradition. Recent years have witnessed a critical reassessment by historians of the complexity of Irish engagement with World War I. Indeed, the powerful symbolism of particular acts of public commemoration, such as that which saw former President Mary McAuley stand alongside Queen Elizabeth at Messines in Belgium in 1998, has also allowed for more inclusive remembering at a public level. Yet so many questions remain, the exploration of which can feed our reflections during this decade of centenaries, commemoration that will run on until 2022. How might we in Ireland remember the First World War in a way that is ethical? And the writing of Michael Longley rings in my head as I say this. What was great about it? He refers to it as the great mistake. What ought we to remember? What is it suggested that we forget? What is open to revision? 
What method should we follow in all of this? What sources should we draw? And what might all this mean for our shared Irishness in the present and future? And again, recalling that I am in a theatre and thinking and respecting, as I do, the independence of theatre and its purpose. As you see, I've often referred to it in previous speeches of a remarkable quotation of Patrick Mason's in this regard. I see theatre as very important in its own right, making the same distillation out of the past that always accepts and respects the sovereignty of the what-if of life whether it is reaching past or reaching into the future. And as to the act of remembering the use of the term itself, I would like to draw on the distinction established by the Israeli philosopher Avishai Margilit in his recent book, The Ethics of Memory. He makes a distinction between common memory and shared memory. In Margilit's definition, Common memory is an aggregated notion that combines the memories of all those people who remember a certain episode, which each of them experienced individually, a point to which I will return. Shared memory, on the other hand, is not simply an aggregate of those individual memories. It is an indirect memory, a memory of memory, which requires communication and seeks to integrate into one version even a single hegemonic version, the different perspectives of those who might have directly remembered a given episode. In other words, it is a memory that goes beyond the experience of anyone alive, and thus we might ask, is it inescapably, in that sense, ideological? In the same way, as ideological as any enforced or induced amnesia. According to Avishai Magilit, modern societies are characterized by a division of mnemonic labor. Shared memory in a modern society travels from person to person through institutions such as archives, through historiographic texts, and through communal devices such as speeches enunciated by public representatives, monuments, and the names of streets. All of these, of course, reflect a distribution of power. We do have monuments to the unknown soldier, but we don't have that many to the unknown social democrat or the unknown liberal or the unknown pacifist. Shared memory then, commemoration, the uses and absences of recollection, is what I believe we are concerned with in this symposium. The choice of what is to be remembered and how are unavoidable issues in the passage from the simple urge to recall to what becomes designated, to what become, in our name, designated acts of commemoration. Commemoration involves a choice, indeed, between events and historical actors, suggested motivations, anticipated consequences, and its purposes may be as elusive and complex as the various original impulses to remember. In other words, only interpretations of memory are collectively remembered and commemorated. Among the competing well sources for commemoration are myths and historiographical discussion. As Effesche Margaret puts it, modern shared memory is located between the push and pull of two poles, history and myth. This notion of shared memory as material, torn between two worldviews, can be likened to the contrast established by Max Weber between, on the one hand, viewing the world as an enchanted place, as the locus of myth, or on the other, viewing the world as a disenchanting place, subject to the work of critical history. To say that shared memory is torn, then, between history and myth does not amount to stating that memory is torn between seeking truth and noble lies. When I speak of myth, I am not just speaking of false beliefs about the past, which may be invested at times with symbolic meaning and charged with powerful emotions. I speak of myth as a founding integrated source to interpret the past or as well, and as importantly, to anticipate the future. Fierke's kind acknowledgement that the lecture I gave 
to the Irish American Society in New York in May of last year inspired him, he tells me, to design today's symposium. As in, and it is an invitation to me somewhat to take up the argument where I left it at that Thomas Flanagan lecture in New York. I argued on that occasion what remembering and imagining have in common is myth-making. The one remembering is often initiated so as to achieve a healing, find a rationalization, construe an event in such a way as to be both a warm cloak for the self and a dagger for the threatening other. The other, imagining, needs myth to retain belief, not merely as assurance or reassurance, important as they are, but as a mechanism for the retention of hope in the unrealized possibilities of being human, truly free, in emancipatory, celebratory, joyous coexistence with and for others. Now, time does not allow me this afternoon to deal extensively with such fundamental a question as to how our present and recent period of experience will be remembered, constituted and contested as the memory of the future. I said on that occasion in New York that I believe that it is in literature that we Irish have perhaps laid bare the full creative potential of myth-making in both senses of memory and imagination. And today, while it may be suggested that the spell of the enchanted world is vanishing under the combined assaults of scientific rationality and critical history, I believe that the two worldviews coexist, that they both continue to be of unrealized value in the way we remember the past, live the present critically, and imagine the future with real, towards realizing our possibilities. The Irish culture of commemoration share with other cultures, shares, shares with other cultures an emphasis on living myths of the heroic dead. Reverend Johnston McMaster, who coordinates a valuable program on education for reconciliation at Trinity College, has in an interesting paper referred to the myth of redemptive violence which infuses Ireland's main political tradition. Such a myth, <coughs> I should say, which infuses Ireland's main political traditions, but such a myth is central to the popular understanding of the Easter Rising, largely interpreted as a necessary sacrifice for Ireland's freedom. But it is also central to the commemorative practices that invoke the blood sacrifice of the 36th Ulster Division, slaughtered at the Somme, a sacrifice which, it is argued, morally obliges Britain towards Ulster loyalism. In nations who are party to wars, commemoration then often takes the shape of rituals intended at revivifying the war's events and its heroes, Margaret names such rituals as revivification rituals. They are rituals usually surrounding mythic heroes, those in-between creatures who belong both to the world of mortals and also to the world of immortals. Revivification can even take the form of the living being called upon to assume roles of their fallen comrades, as is captured, for example, in the final stanza of Canadian poet John McRae's piece entitled In Flanders Field, published in 1915. Take up, our <coughs> take up our quarrel with the foe. To you from failing hands we throw the torch. Be yours to hold it high. If ye break faith with us who die, we shall not sleep though poppies grow in Flanders Field. What sense are we supposed to make of such, of such instances of myth-making sourced in war, aimed at revivification, and the experience of it? Does Irish reconciliation with the memory of World War I involve an accommodation of such myths? And what might this mean from an ethical perspective? The First World War gave rise to a brand of literature and poetry which radically undermined the link 
between patriotic duty and heroic death. Many war poets have related, in a direct, almost hyper-realist fashion, what life in the trenches was really like. The insipid food, the forced intimacy between soldiers, the noise, the screams, and the dazzling light of exploding shells. The war fostered the affirmation of the singularity of the poet's vi voice in the face of collective slaughter. It also engendered a new poetical diction based on the rejection of the orderly formalism of pre-war versification. The notion of heroic death as realized idealism was comprehensively rejected by many, by many poets such as Robert Graves or Blaise Sendra. For example, they have strongly refuted idealist dualism the supposed ability of the human spirit to overlook everyday reality and bodily suffering. In The White Goddess, Robert Graves tellingly abandoned the radiant figure of Apollo for that of Dionysius, the suffering god. And as for the French novelist and poet, Blaise Sendar, who lost his writing hand in the war, he explicitly refused to be a penholder for heroic death. In an excerpt translated from his memoir entitled The Severed Hand in 1946, he wrote, It is sweet and fitting to die for your country, isn't it? Do you believe yourself to be at the theatre, sir? Have you lost any sense of reality? You are not at the Comédie Française here. Do you know what hides beneath this Alexandrine? War is an ignominy. The Alexandrine in question... It is sweet and fitting to die for your country, is the translation, of course, of a line from Horace's ode, Dulce et decorum est pro patria mori, words which were widely quoted before the war. The English poet Wilfred Owen also derided this same line in his poem Dulce et decorum est in 1917 in which the Horatian motto is juxtaposed to a vivid description of the horrors of a gas attack. In his poem, Dolce et Decorum Est, these lines occur. Gas! Gas! Quick, boys! An ecstasy of fumbling fitting the clumsy helmets just in time, but someone still was yelling out and stumbling and floundering like a man in fire or lime. Dim through the misty panes and thick green light, as under a green sea, I saw him drowning. And it goes on. If in some smothering dreams you too could pace, behind the wagon that we flung him in, and watched the white eyes writhing in his face, his hanging face like a devil sick of sin, if you could hear at every jolt the blood come gathering from the froth-corrupted lungs, obscene as cancer, bitter as the cud of vile, incurable sores on innocent tongues, my friend, you would not tell, with such high zest, to children ardent for some desperate glory, the old lie, dulce et decorum est pro patria mori. Such depictions of the personal experience of tremendous human suffering generated by war is not, of course, to everybody's taste. And in his 1936 Oxford Anthology of Modern English Verse, William Butler Yeats famously made the controversial choice of excluding all of the World War I combatant poets, stating that passive suffering is not material for good literature. Yeats, in his preface to the Oxford Book of Modern Verse in that year of 36, wrote, I have a distaste for certain poems written in the midst of the Great War. He uses the word great. The writers of these poems were invariably officers of exceptional courage and capacity. One a man constantly selected for dangerous work. All, I think, had the military cross. Their letters are vivid and humorous. They were not without joy. For all, skill is joyful, but felt bound in the words of the best known to plead the suffering of their men. In poems that had for a time considerable fame, written in the first person. They made that suffering their own. I have rejected these poems for the same reason that made Arnold withdraw 
his Empedocles on Etna from circulation. Passive suffering is not a theme for poetry. In all the great tragedies, tragedy is a joy to the man who dies. In Greece, the tragic chorus danced. If the war is necessary or necessary in our time and place, it is best to forget its suffering as we do the discomfort of fever. Remembering our comfort at midnight when our temperature fell, or as we forgot the worst moments of the more painful disease. Florence Farr, returning third class from Ireland, found herself among Connacht Rangers just returned from the Boer War, who described an incident over and over, and always with loud laughter. An unpopular sergeant, struck by a shell, turned round and round like a dancer, wound in his own entrails. That too might be a right way of seeing war, if war is necessary, the way of the Cockney slums, of Patrick Street, of, Kilmen, of the Kilmena Minute, of Johnny I Hardly Knew Ye, of the medieval dance of death. In Yeats's view, then, the crude reality of human suffering was not to be remembered by posterity. I suggest otherwise, that these poems, novels, and literary memoirs, written during or after the war, can take their place as enabling sources for ethical remembering. I don't want to be poor, uh, poor, tough on, on, or too tough uh, on Yeats, but as I was writing this, I recalled also uh, what he had written in his poem, uh, in, 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 his, in his poem, in memory of Eva Gorbuth and Con Markovic, when he suggested, wrote, "I know not what the young, speaking of Eva." I know not what the younger dreams, some vague utopia and she seems, when withered old and skeleton gaunt, an image of such politics. In fairness, it should be said that he was not aware of the cancer which would take Eva's life at the age of 56. In Yeats's view, as I've said, the crude reality of human suffering wasn't stuff for posterity. I think the mundane myths, however, these minor stories, as Yeats would have it, of human suffering, of resilience, and friendship too, can, I contend, nurture groundbreaking historiography, as well as prompting new forms of myth-making. Forms that are not simply underpinned by glorious idealism or grand narratives, but that face into what it means to experience violence, to lose mental and bodily integrity, to have multiple loyalties forced on you, to be forced to choose one side or the other, or to, have make, to make adjustments that bring contradictions between inherited beliefs and thoughts and present or personal circumstances that force a response. These stories can be an inspiring source for present-day myth-makers, memory-tellers and contemporary historians alike. And one of the fields in which the new Irish historiography has recently made much progress is in the study of violence, its sources, and of how the first decade of the 20th century brought about a militarization of Irish politics, a militarization that sprung from different groups of memory who projected different futures. I think, for example, as well, of the neglected history of the citizen army by Horico Kohasik, Shauna Casey, of course. I think as well, even with the years of distancing, we have not fully examined the consequences of the example I have chosen World War I here in Ireland. And such difficulties we have had in facing into our own culture of violence probably has to do with the long shadow cast by the conflict in Northern Ireland and the reluctance to draw conclusions which might prove disturbing for contemporary actors. A respect for such complexity as does not sink into relativism is another benefit to be gained from engaging with the writings of Irish World War I soldiers. We need to better understand these men's multi-layered sense of belonging, the complex motives and circumstances which led them to volunteer, maybe, to join the British Army. It is well known, for example, that Thomas Kettle enlisted as he wrote to further the cause of home rule. But another example is Francis Ledwidge, an Irish nationalist and poet born and slain in 1887. 
the son of a poor labourer. And despite his initial reluctance to enlist, Ledwidge too believed that his joining the British Army was a means to advance the cause of Irish independence from Britain. Yet Francis Ledwidge learned of the Easter Rising and the executions of its nationalist leaders while he was recovering from his wounds in Manchester in 1916. And as testament to the complex intertwining of loyalties which characterised Irish involvement with that war, he wrote one of his best-known poems in honour of his close friend, Thomas MacDonagh. Ledwich was killed in Flanders on the 31st of July 1917 as he was drinking tea in a shell hole with five comrades. He is buried in Bosing alongside the Welsh language poet, Hedwin, one among the 31,000 Allied soldiers who were killed on that one same day. So contemporary work too, such as Sebastian Barry's novel A Long, Long Way, can inspire us to respect complexity, allow for contingency, as we move to examine more closely the entanglements between the Easter Rising and the Psalm, and the great dilemmas of those who were involved in these respective events. And while it is essential to recognise the complexities of Irish identity at the turn of the 20th century, Indeed, as today, there are also dangers in an ideology of inclusiveness at any price. Such an ideology of inclusiveness is, at any price is in fact distracting from our purposes. It is crucial not to gloss over differences, to acknowledge what separated people in the various ideological groups in Irish society felt and wrote, but what we are seeking is a tapestry with different colours and threads some of which were frail, as well as those which are strong. For example, I have already mentioned it, the citizen army as described by Pio Kohasek and its relationship to the Irish volunteers, and the relationship both of them in turn to the national volunteers is an example of such complexity. But the language too is important, the language that is in that pamphlet of Pio Kohasek's, and the use, for example, redly sunk the sun, and the imputation onto the sadness of the Liffey, of the experience of people and the power of the collective. We must be aware of the potential pitfalls contained in the injunction to, to accept the psalm as the memory of the other in the name of reconciliation. The psalm is equally the battle of those Irish nationalists who fought alongside Ulster loyalists. And it is important, too, not to deny or to take from them agency of the men and women of the past. Those who voluntarily engaged in an armed conflict were not just passive victims, as a currently widespread trend in European commemorative language suggests. And finally, any critique of nationalist excesses should not be equated for a second with the dismissal of national pride or its place. So what conclusions might we draw then from all this that might help us to define a tentative basis for what I call an ethical culture of commemoration? The first important point, I think, is that commemoration should never jeopardize historical accuracy. Timothy Snyder, an eminent historian of the Holocaust, has warns us against a culture of commemoration which, I quote him, requires no adequate explanation of the catastrophe, only an aesthetically realisable image of its victims. As cultures of memory supplant concern for history, he wrote, the danger is that historians will find themselves drawn to explanations that are simplest to convey. This observation corroborates French historian François Fouré's views on the bicentennial of the French Revolution celebrations in 1989 when he outlined the dangers of commemorative history, wherein that which is most elegantly commemorated becomes that which is most felicitously narrated. Indeed, commemoration often runs the risk of projecting to the contemporary emotions of the present onto the past. Or as Timothy Snyder put it, with commemorative causality, the boundaries of history are set by the contingencies of empathy. As we commemorate events which unfolded a hundred years ago, 
It is therefore crucial, I suggest, that we endeavor to do justice to the complexity of the historical context as outlined in contemporary historical research, while also recognizing contingency and refraining from reading history uncritically from any contemporary, even any contemporary ethical standpoint. The conventional wisdom of the time of World War I, ideologies such as militarism, theories of race, the Protestant theology of empire, the Catholic mystical blood sacrifice, need to be engaged with as carefully as possible, with respect, with rigor, and also, but most important, utilizing scholarly discipline. Commemorative practices might gain, too, from making clear the possibilities and limits of what Paul Ricoeur has called the historiographical operation, including how the tools used by historians to, apprehend, to, to comprehend past events, such as archives, testimony, and so forth, are actually deployed, and within what boundaries. We need to, to overcome the currently widespread preference for internal psychological and national history over external sociological and transnational history. And in this regard, recontextualizing the Irish experience of World War I within a European framework is an important first step. So the unfolding decade of centenaries offers us with a, a wonderful occasion to reappropriate to the repressed parts of our history, to include in our narratives the forgotten voices and the lost stories of the past, those of the World War I Irish poets, but also the point of view of women. For example, that of the 1913 lockout workers, who decided to join the British Army because the king's shilling was more generous than a worker's wage in the Dublin of the 1910s. And as we are in the theatre, and I'm coming to the end, I suggest we might recall Bertolt Brecht's questions from a worker who reads with those wonderful lines. The young Alexander conquered in India. Was he alone? Caesar defeated the Gauls. Did he not even have a coup with him? Philip of Spain wept when his armada went down. Was he the only one to weep? Every page of victory. Who cooked the feast for the victors? I have referred to the dangers inherent in commemoration, but I also want to insist on the many opportunities these centenaries offer us. Opportunities to add, to restore, to revise. Opportunity to recall the excluded. I've already mentioned women in general, but I mean in particular, such as Eva Gobut, to read again O'Casey's language in the history of the citizen army. And it is an opportunity to depart with a new set of responsibilities. Ethical commemoration need not be extraneous either to historical understanding or to myth-making. And I would like to reiterate the call I made in New York for new myth-making a call that would be for myth-making that would be both contextualized historically but also emancipatory, respecting the right of unrealized dreams to be remembered as well as the facts of failure. Indeed, it is to be hoped that all our old narratives of betrayals and failures will not determine the agenda of the future. We need new myths that not only carry the burden of history but fly from it Make something new. All myths reworked and reworn can become a frame for something contemporary and mold-breaking as we need. They can be a vehicle for what nervous silences had sought to cover, for intimacies forbidden, racisms tenderly disguised, and faiths no longer trusted, but then not easily discarded either and never forgotten. This decade of centenaries is an opportunity to consider how Ireland has been and must now again be renewed through memory and imagination and a new space filled with new ideas. And in that task we are invited to go beyond what is calculable, what is even seemingly reasonable. We are given the possibility of moving along the arc of a heroic encounter with the morality of forgiveness and love as artists in different generations have moved us. 
such as Michael Longley did in his beautiful Homeric poem Ceasefire, which addressed the difficulty of overcoming the past, of breaking the cycle of violence. Ceasefire. Put in mind of his own father and moved to tears. Achilles took him by the hand and pushed the old king gently away. But Priam curled up at his feet and wept with him until their sadness filled the building. Taking Hector's corpse into his own hands, Achilles made sure it was washed and for the old king's sake laid out in uniform, ready for Priam to carry. Wrapped like a present home to Troy at daybreak. When they had eaten together it pleased them both to stare at each other's beauties as lovers might. Achilles built like a god, Priam good-looking still and full of conversation, who earlier had sighed. I get down on my knees and do what must be done and kiss Achilles' hand, the killer of my son, Garamilamach.